one person has issues. Oh, we're live. We're live now. We're live, boys. Welcome back to Wildcatters Live, episode four, where we talk about whatever the hell we want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go through, let's introduce everyone that we got today, because we got a few people. We got my man, Ted, Kyle, Joe. Ted, let's start out with you, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Ted Kernan. I'm a founder and CEO of Subsurface IO. I'm a geologist by training, but a full stack developer now by trade. And I've also traveled a bit around the world. So I enjoy um, living in Houston for the moment, but might move at some point. <laughs> it sounded like you're pretty confident that you're not going to stay here. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I actually, I, I've been in Houston for 10 years now and, and I really like it. Like, you know, compared to anywhere else, uh, you know, we could have kind of the way we live here. I, I really enjoy Houston. So yeah, Houston ain't a bad place. I like it here. Kyle, what about you, man? Uh, yeah. Thanks man. Thanks for having us on. Uh, Kyle Chapman, one of the co-founders of mineral energy tech company focused on, Mineral and royalty acquisition. So, uh, by study, not not a developer or anything like that. Uh, mostly been around oil and gas tech on the commercial side for a while, and uh, having some fun over here. Trying to take this call from the dark abyss. Uh, the power <laughs> went out of my place. So, if I lose you guys, I'll hop back in when I can. Hey man, you're making shit happen. Just run it off of the phone. You're doing good. Joe, go ahead and give your bio, man. Uh, all right. I'm uh, Joe Meadows, currently co-founder and CEO at a company called OpsLock. We're an uh, uh, industrial risk management platform uh, with a bit of a focus in the oil and gas world. Professionally, uh, my background's uh, in the seafaring world, so I have a master mariner's license and uh, worked in offshore oil and gas in the ultra deep water infrastructure development sector for uh, about 10 years putting in pipelines and subsea components and things like that from the Gulf of Mexico to India to who know, who knows where else. Man, you make it kind of sound boring. Like you should just be like, dude, as a fucking captain of shit. Well, to be fair, I was, I was the chief mate. I wasn't the captain, but I could have been. Look, people like me don't know the fucking difference. So you can tell us whatever you want. <laughs> you have to make captain. Captain, man. The real question is you ever run into any pirates, right? I mean, that's, that's the story <laughs> I want to hear. So. Uh, well, so, Maybe not run into that might be overselling it, but we uh, I did do a run once from Rosyth in Scotland, uh, and we took a, a load of cable from there to India, and that took us through the Mediterranean and then into uh, through the Suez Canal and then into the Gulf of Oman, which is where all the uh, I'm the captain now stuff happens. Um, <laughs> so we. Uh, I was I was also ship security officer. That was one of the hats that I wore. So we had to not only wrap the whole boat in barbed wire, but we actually hired I think three or four uh, like gunmen to come and hang out, and uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. We we had a couple. Do you like did you like hop on Craigslist like Hey, I need a couple guys that are strapped. <laughs> yeah, pirates. Well, I I think much like the. Um, much like the sort of, I don't know, I know they don't call them mercenaries, security contractors scene for sort yeah. of ex-military guys. They, they're, they're mercenaries. <laughs> they're mercenaries. So there's there's a pretty, I think, booming business for boats that go through there. It's all about reducing the insurance rates, especially for things like um, container shipping. So basically these guys were all ex-SAS guys from, from the UK and they would get on and then they would go to like a mothership. So they, we, they would get on in, in the Mediterranean. They'd come on our ship. They'd run through. I think it took about a week while they were sitting on board with us. And then uh, when we got out the other side, this little speedboat came along. The guys went down the ladder, hop on the speedboat, and then they'd go wait at like a mothership boat until uh, like the next boat that hired them came through and they'd go up, back the other way. So that was their whole life. It, uh, apparently, they didn't get paid that much, so it sounded pretty shitty, but uh, they they had cool guns. Wow. Joe, what's your thoughts on, uh, have you seen everything that's happened with that Navy uh, ship captain? Yeah. What's what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I think the, obviously I got, I have a lot of empathy for, I, I forget the gentleman's name, but, but the yeah, master who, who sort of made the call there. Uh, I think that the 
yeah, it, it was a PR nightmare for the Navy. I, I think their biggest concern was was chain of command, which is a big deal in in those sort of hierarchical organizations. That that at least that's how they justified it. I'm sure a bit of it was was the bad PR, but that uh, the leaking of the letter was the real issue. But anyway, I you could tell by the reaction that went viral of of all those sailors sort of giving them the round of applause. Like that's that's your job when you're in that capacity, and if you know, as long as the crew is united behind you, I mean, uh, props to him. I, I'm sure he's going to have a great career in media. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sounds kind of fucked up, but I wasn't in the Navy and my Marine experience is very limited as well. But obviously that video went viral and he had the support of everyone on the ship. So I guess that's what matters at the end of the day, right? Yeah, I'm, I mean, those the the amount of personnel on those aircraft carriers is so massive. Like I. If I was in his shoes, which which I you know the the largest ships I worked on, we had about two hundred crew, which is still a lot, sort of on the on the scale of ships and uh, whatever they have several thousand like that. That's real scary, especially once you start to have confirmed cases and and that starts to get out of control. Like uh, I I'd probably do a lot more than write a letter. Yeah, for sure. You know what's uh, what's interesting about that whole situation with this sh- with the ship is also the the cruise ship. That was that started in Chile and then ended up in Florida. Did you hear about that? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's, what, that's a nightmare. That was crazy. And what, what people don't realize is that because shipping is kind of out of our minds now, you know, we take airplanes places, we take cars and everything else. It's so many laws are based on maritime law. Like all of our airline laws are based on maritime law. And so these are all coming back into play with the coronavirus because things like, do you let a ship dock, right? Or do you let it out offload passengers with a, with a contagion? These were things that were big deals you know, 100 to 150 years ago. And now they're coming back into play when do you let a, a cruise ship full of you know, elderly people that were down in Chile land in Florida or not because they might spike the number of cases you have. Yeah, do y'all think the cruise? Really do y'all think the cruise ship industry is dead after this? Uh, the cruise ship industry was pretty nasty before this. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in creative accounting, the cruise ship industry is a great place to start looking. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, yeah, like the the cruise world. To your point, Ted, the 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 sort of nautical flags that you might see, like in the bar Private of somebody who has a yeah. sailboat and thinks it's too big of a deal. Um, they, w- one of those flags, so, so it, it spells out the alphabet and the Q flag, which is a yellow one, uh, that when, when you come into a port, you're supposed to ho- hoist that flag and that indicates that you're in quarantine. And when you're doing, when you're sailing ships internationally, that's like a, a standard part of the process that's been glazed over a lot in the past couple of years. And, uh, I'm sure much more in play right now. I actually have a buddy who's been on an oil tanker. Um, bouncing around the North Sea with a bunch of, you know, bunch of crude on board, and he's been on board since January, and yeah. they just, well, they, they basically he's he's Canadian, and they've just basically told him, stand by until further notice. As of right now, all crew changes are suspended, and not only wow. will they not let him off the boat, but he can't come home. Like there's no flights, so he's just sort of working indefinitely, and that's something that we've seen. Like a lot, a lot of my connections are in the offshore world, and that's. That's par for the course. Basically, if you were on board when what's going on in the world right now went down, you better be comfortable. Hope you brought extra toothpaste because you're not going home. It's kind of the extreme opposite of the stay at home order, right? It's the stay at work order. (laughs) (laughs) Stay quarantined on the platform. That's uh, (laughs) interesting. Is that all three? So all three of you guys are are CEOs of tech companies in energy. Everything that's happened with COVID nineteen has any of this affected the way that you're thinking about business moving forward, like recession proofing, coronavirus pandemic proofing your businesses at all? How do you pandemic proof well, your business? I, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll go first. I mean, we were always a remote, you know, workforce. We've been working remote uh, internally, right? Because we go and, and work at client offices and embed ourselves in client offices as we install the uh, the software. 
But yeah, this kind of just shows that that model is not going away anytime soon, right? You need to be able to just sit down and work wherever you are. And then I guess the other one that would like the recession proof kind of comment that you that you brought up is I've always believed in building a building a business off of cash flow, right? And so again, that just kind of shows glad we didn't over leverage ourselves when we thought oil was maybe going to go back to 80, right? Now we're just hoping it'll go back to the 40 and 60, but um, yeah, it, it just, it pays to be able to, to really, you know, run your business no matter what happens. So we're, yeah, Ted, you know, I saw a good, uh, I saw something yeah. on Twitter either yesterday or the day before someone tweeted that a bunch of startups are about to learn the difference between um, free cash flow and negative earnings. And, right. you know, you're about to see like a lot of startups are about to be like, Oh shit, maybe we should have focused on, um, actually making some money instead of being in 100% yeah, well, growth mode. And the biggest ones, right, like Airbnb is in trouble, right? We work was already in trouble and it's now even worse in trouble. And so, yeah, I saw, some, I saw some news on Airbnb. Um, I should look it up right now, but something along the lines of they got a billion dollars in debt. Um, they did. That's from it as an emergency yeah. line. Yeah, I think it was a billion dollars. Not sure. I'll have to go back and look. But yeah, that yeah, same I mean, article those... said it was ten uh, percent interest on that, though. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Tillman Fertitta with his business, I saw that he's um, you know trying to attract lenders for fifteen fifteen percent yield. So some of these guys are in trouble. I see here on one of the comments. Uh, I think Josh Pollard said that the Saudis bought. Um, Crew stocks, I'm assuming. I know they were buying up some. I saw something that they were buying up oil stocks. So pretty advantageous for them to just flood the market with oil and then scoop up everyone's equities um, while they're distressed. I mean, I guess if you got a big dick like that, you can flex it every once in a while, right? <laughs> Saudi's got the biggest one of them all. <laughs> you can hold the chips, man. Um, yeah. Speaking of these companies and different business models, um, do you all uh, watch UFC? Joe, you used to fight, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, for a while. Did y'all see the Joe, thing? Uh, Joe's hoodie covers up all his uh, his sleeve tats. Dude's like more tat than Arm McGregor. He's a legit a sailor. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> plays the part well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, did y'all see Dana White or UFC 249 actually pushed back um, or postponed, but Dana White was going to get a private island, um, one where he could bring in fighters and was just going to host fights there, but he actually, they just postponed it a couple hours ago. And everyone was kind of making comments about this was going to be like the real life Mortal Kombat, just having all these fighters come to this private <laughs> island. Before you right there. drop them in like Fortnite, like so these guys have to like fly in, <laughs> yeah, pop yeah. Out, and then just like battle to the death. Well, I, I was under the impression that it had been leaked that it was actually uh, an Indian reservation in California, which was the actual island. Um, I saw something about this. I didn't look too much into it, and the headline that I saw was there's actually that, that reservation has some type of history for MMA. Like they actually used to do uh, one league or uh, promotion used to do a lot of fights there. So I don't yeah. know, I have, to, I have to look into it. That'd be bullshit I though. Saw, I, I want an actual <laughs> fucking private island. If you say a private island, not an Indian reservation. Yeah, it, the be, theatrics would have been much better, but I'm pretty sure I saw it on, I think uh, Uncle Chael was the one who was saying that it was leaked, that it was uh, a... <laughs> Uh, this Indian reservation, and I, it's like I fire, be so it's like Fire Festival all over. I again. was about to bring up Fire Festival, <laughs> like yeah. UFC's version of Fire Festival. Yeah, I guess we keep losing Kyle. Yeah, yeah Kyle, Kyle's got a rough one here. I don't think he's gotten one word in so far. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shoot him a text and let him know. Just we'll, we'll catch him on the next one. Yeah, we'll get him on the next one when his power's not out. Hey, uh, <laughs> Jake, bring up Robert Smith's comment here. He's got a really good question. Oh, wow. I didn't see these comments. Look at all those. Yeah, if you go over to live comments, uh, people are over here. They'll start talking shit oh, nice. every once in a while. Yeah, so we'll bring them up here on the screen. Um, now that we got people in here, hold on real quick before we take this question. We got people in here. So real quick, let's do another recap. Uh, uh, if you guys want to tell who you guys are, Joe and Ted, give another introduction real quick. Start with Joe. Uh, Joe Meadows, uh, co-founder and CEO of OpsLock, uh, industrial risk management sort of SaaS platform. 
Ted Kernan, founder of Subsurface IO, a geologic platform to combine all of the subsurface data in one interface. Cool. Uh, before we bring up Robert's comment, uh, Josh Pollard said something about the uh, um, Tony Ferguson fight. I just got to put my comments out there. Jake, I think you agree with me. Like, no one wants to fucking see a fight if it's not Khabib and Tony Ferguson. Like, that's a fight that we wanted to see. No one wants to see anything else. Anything else is just subpar. Yeah, I agree. So, this is the fifth time, if you guys don't know this, the fifth time that Ferguson Khabib has been put off. And it just was wasn't funny meant to happen. The, yeah, Belarus said that they would allow a fight to be held there. Um, you know, Khabib was able to get over there. They were going to fly Ferguson in. Khabib didn't want to take the fight. Ferguson Gaethje, yeah, Gaethje is a, a top contender, but Ferguson is on a completely different level. He's going to completely dismantle Gaethje. Yeah, I, I think that the it's not the fight everybody wants to see right now. <laughs> and from a fairness perspective, if it's not going to be Khabib, it should have been Poirier. This, this could fall down a, a whole other rabbit hole. But uh, as far as rankings and all those other things, Poirier's the the man in that top three. Uh, I know it's yeah. not as compelling because he's already gotten his ass whooped, but still. <laughs> Fair point. Okay, hey, we got some good comments uh, on oil and gas startups, especially since we have some oil and gas startup founders here. So let's hit some of these. Uh, pull up Robert's comment, Jake. He asked, how many startups across the space do you think will go under? A lot of startups we look at operate with minimal cash reserves. Man, um, to be honest, you know, I think that – oil and gas over the next year is going to be a bloodbath. And I don't think that startups come away from this unscathed. So I think that you're going to see, unfortunately, a lot of people go under. I mean, you have some that are that are still killing it. But even, you know, you look at Corva, Rig Up, you know, some of your leaders in the space, you know, they're they're having a hard time. And I think that you're going to it's going to be pretty widespread. I think the startups you know, I think there are startups that are actually positioned to do well, and it's probably startups that haven't raised capital. Um, well, database, you know, some companies like Task, you know, Task is bootstrapped. They're used to not having fucking money, so, you know, they, they, they can weather a storm. Um, but, you know, some of your other companies that have started growing faster, you know, they're, they're already having mass layoffs, mass pay cuts. And it doesn't look like things are going to turn around anytime soon. So, you know, to give a percentage, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you see 70% of oil and gas startups go under. Yeah, yeah no, I think what exactly what Colin said, it was there's too many startups that are absolutely tethered to things like the rig count, rig count drops to, to what it is now. They're having to lay off, and especially when you, you've raised a lot of capital, you're in super growth mode. Companies like like you mentioned, Rig Up, you know, they laid off over 100 employees. They had to. Um, yeah, it's it's really really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I think downturn aside as well. I mean, it's not what over the next sort of 18 to 24 months, we're going to see a shrinkage of the economy in in a pretty meaningful way. So we're going to be looking at. You know, if we got 20 to 30 percent of businesses in a general sense going under like the restaurant economy with with what's going on right now is going to get hit in a huge way. Yeah. Um, so if you, I think in, in the oil and gas world, when you look at the combination of, of a looming sort of overall recession with what what our friends in Saudi Arabia and Russia are doing right now, I think, uh, yeah, the blood in the streets, I think, is, is fair to say. Yeah. Well. Obviously, you know, you guys bring up very good points. I'll, I'll put a kind of a positive spin on it in terms of uh, oil and gas startups is that oil and gas has always been the leader, you know, for the last hundred years in technology. And so what I think might save some people in the space, and it's certainly an opportunity that, that we see moving forward is thinking of the startups as science startups or engineering startups. Right, because there are so many industries that rely on science and practical science. Like, you know, you take things that you learn at school and then you actually make them, put them into industrial use, either extracting oil and gas or in, in bio, biogenetics or in chemistry or whatever have you. They're missing that um, startup vibe 
because so many startups that we've seen over the years have been only in the services industries, like how to, how to get people to order more food, how to make them travel easier, how to get them to stay places. But we don't see a lot of science startups. And so that's where I would say in the silver lining of this might be um, scientists in this field for oil and gas taking what they've learned or, or repivoting their science startups to apply to other industries or to the energy sector itself, but as it evolves, right? As oil and gas kind of slowly over the over the next decades might fade away a little bit. And then we have other energy uh, issues come up or other forms of exploiting the subsurface become more important. Yeah, Ted, I think it's interesting what you said about oil and gas being the leader in technology over the last hundred years, because I would disagree with that. Um, but with a caveat, when you look at what we've done in terms of engineering and downhole, especially in the last decade, it's unbelievable. I mean, I think it's fucking fascinating what we've done and being able to drill horizontally and everything with fracking, yada, 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 yada. But when you look at digital solutions, I mean, it's plain as day that, or clear as day that, you know, we, we lack, you know, 10 years plus behind other industries. And on last oh, yeah. week, on last week's live call, we had one of our buddies, Yusuf, who's um, executive vice president of a pretty sizable conventional EMP. And we're talking about, you know, does this downturn increase the demand for digital technology? And he pretty much comes out it's like, fuck no, I'm an oil man. At the end of the day, I realize that I'm an oil man. I got to figure out how to get a barrel out of the ground, you know, uh, as cheap as possible. And you know, I think it's kind of twofold. You know, we have digital technologies that can help EMPs be more efficient, but at the end of the day, they look at themselves as oil men and they don't have the time of day to look at, you know, your little bullshit fucking software. So I, I see it from, from two different perspectives. Yes, mechanically engineering, we've been innovative, but from a digital perspective, we haven't. I yeah, think I, I mean, think there's I think there's a window, right? And I think and I think the window it, it really depends on the commodity price. Once you're getting below thirty dollar oil, it's like all the greatest technology in the world is not going <laughs> to magically make commodity prices go up. Which is really going to be one of your biggest levers. Um, really, you know, the your biggest levers are going to be commodity price and then how much you're actually producing. And those two are really going to affect your economics more than anything. And when you're in full on survival mode, you know, a marginal increase with technology is not actually going to help. It does. It, it helps significantly, you know, whenever you can actually sustain yourself with a, a reasonable commodity price. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, to, to Ted's point, I mean, I mean, the, the crux of what his message was to survive as an oil and gas startup. Don't be an oil and gas startup. Right. Uh, so <laughs> yes, he, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's, you know, as, as it relates to survival in, in these days, I mean, it's it's just arithmetic. Don't don't spend more money than you have and wait. I think that I think the biggest threat, I mean, obviously, there's the, there's the issues with the cash flow and there's the issues of growing too fast. But I think the thing is that so many people that you're calling on, right, you know, as a, as a startup and you're reaching out to, to various, EMP, whether it's EMP market, whether it's OFS market, so many people are losing their jobs that, from what I've heard from everybody that I've talked to, it's not just that did the sales cycle come to a screeching halt. It's that every one of my contacts at these companies now don't work there. Yeah. What I'm to what, one of the things that we were counseled on fairly early, you know, me coming from an oil and gas background was, you know, for, our investors don't come from the oil and gas space or, or not all of them. And their attitude was, you know, looking from it externally, and I think this is something that people in the industry sometimes lose, is they said, hey, man, you're focusing on an incredibly cyclical market. Don't only focus on people in this space, because if this industry takes a turn, you have no way to to sort of maneuver around that, and you're just going to get killed. So, um, you know, we were, we were lucky enough to take that advice uh, into account and, and got lucky. But it's, uh, yeah, like, to, to, like you're saying, Jake, like, don't spend money on marketing when there is no demand. Like it's not about capturing available demand. There's just nothing there. You gotta gotta hide. We our sales guys. I told them to, like, do not call anyone who is directly tied to the oil and gas space. Man, get the get Joe off of our fucking show, man. You're hurting my what? ad revenue here. Get the fuck off. Joe isn't going to sponsor us now. The the <laughs> the reality being like you know again like like Jake said like you call these guys and they're either not working there anymore. Or they're about to not be working there anymore. That's that's a that's a tough spot. So, um, 
you yeah, know, Jeremy, again, we, we just got to diversify. Jeremy Funk in the comments brought up a good point. So Jeremy is an OG in oil and gas software space. Actually, he's about to launch a new podcast on digital wildcatters here in the next few weeks. So a um, really knowledgeable, knowledgeable guy, but he thinks that the sweet spot for software vendors is 60 to 80 oil above or below and there are other more pressing concerns. And I see where he, you know, kind of going back to that conversation of anything below that, these oil guys are like, I'm an oil guy. I got to focus on that. And anything above $80, they're like, fuck it, hundred dollar oil. We'll just drill another well. Like we don't give a fuck about being efficient. Yeah. yeah I a hundred percent agree. 100%. Yeah. I mean, well, you also have to think about, um, you know, a lot of startups in this space focused on being, you know, the, there weren't efficiency startups necessarily, right? And so they were focused more on like AI or trying to replace people uh, with, with, with machines or trying to uh, come up like with the next shiny thing that you could analyze with. And when you really get down to it, there's a lot of, like you, like you said, right? Like technology-wise, the industry is very behind in terms of digital technology. But it is the place where technology has real world implications and can make you a lot of money, right? If you apply it directly, because there's so much money to be made. So um, while I can see why, you know, 60 to 80 oil would be would be kind of a market, a, mar a market for that. I still think that there's even way below this, even today, right? There are uh, efficiencies to be gained from softwares that still are of interest to companies. Uh, because because of the way that the technology is being applied, it's kind of changed. So the original wave of startups was applied in one way, and now we're applying it in a different way. How how, how do you address risk tolerance in that? I mean, uh, for for those of us as as startup founders, I I certainly found myself sort of preaching the same message. But I think in in the current world, just the risk tolerance of the vendors, even if you could go in and save them, you know, five or ten percent even of their opex. It's a, it's a tough sell these yeah. days. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, one one of the things that you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping to see, and 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 I think we're going to see it, is that there was also a lot of software and kind of services bundled in with the bigger companies, you know, the Halliburton and the Schlumberger's of the world. And when oil is at sixty or eighty, right, they're providing all of these services, and they just throw in, oh, here's an extra software package for an extra. $2 million or even for free, right? We'll give you $10 million worth of software, quote unquote, that's their list price for free. Um, as those service companies suffer, right? They're, they'll be less likely to throw in their own software in with their services. And then you actually can have a conversation about, hey, our software is you know half the price and it does four times what this other software, 10 times what the other software does, but it's not, but you actually have to, you know, come talk to us, learn about it. We have to install it. It's not just being thrown in with this 50 million, hundred million dollar contract. So yeah, that's where there's a little more opportunity. Yeah. I, I think you're totally right there. And that I think, you know, even though today, like I, I wouldn't be getting on the phone this week and calling anybody trying to sell them anything. Uh, I think in, in the next, you know, in maybe a year from now, as things start to turn around, I mean, certainly what, what I've seen in uh, some of the most, the most impactful EMPs, especially that I've spoken to, uh, you know, there is a, a huge difference in, and Ted, you can probably uh, empathize with this, that I've spoken to certain EMPs, especially ones that are based in Scandinavia, where I can go in, I, I had a round table with, I think about or eight or 10 of their C-suite management of a Scandinavian EMP. And they're talking to me about like, why do you use a certain software stack? Why do you use this data and and they they had a level of sort of um, of ownership of of digital sort of first content in a way that I I hadn't seen at all in in mm -hmm. other parts of the industry and I think that or my assumption you know and just looking at the trends that you see in literally every other industry in the world is in these leaner times those people who are thinking a little bit more aggressively and thinking about to to borrow a, a canadian hockey uh metaphor like they're they're looking where the puck is going not where the puck currently is uh th those are going to be the guys who survive and who who make a difference as everything consolidates over the next 12 months and uh you know people make aggressive moves being a canadian do you have any uh maple syrup quotes that i can use uh 
I'll I'll check my my uh, library <laughs> and I'll get back to you. Uh, I, I don't know what's more really the right one to <laughs> I got you. Gonna, I went I went through this in 2015, you know, through the that was my first kind of downturn. We launched GDSware in 2014 and we watched oil crash from $100 a barrel down to $26 a barrel. And so I had to lay off our entire staff. Um so we we kind of did it in waves and then we tried to hold on as long as we could uh to certain key people, but it went from being me and a co-founder up to like 15 or so people back down to me and a co-founder. And we were lucky enough to have some funding from uh, an angel investor and we had enough cash to kind of get us through. And so what we did was we didn't, I literally didn't make any sales calls, any outreach for six months, probably at least. Um, and all we did is at that point in time, we had so much feedback from, uh, you know, potential customers at that point that we just went back to the drawing board and just focused all of our attention on R&D and just built the product and do much better products. And whenever we finally had interest and the commodity price started to come back up, uh, it was a much better environment for us. And it was much easier to demo, it was much easier to sign contracts. So, Hey, over on the comments real quick, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Jordan Timms. He said he paused this Biggie Smalls playlist for this hashtag bro pick. If you haven't seen our new bro pet cats on the website, we're starting our own oil cartel, getting everyone wrangled up. Um, Department of Energy is already aware of bro pet, so go over to our website and get that. Plus, you can get your free cash flow joggers if you need to be comfortable at the house while you're working and remind these EMPs that they need to provide a positive free cash flow. You can get those joggers. So. <laughs> so let's tell the story from this morning. So this morning, so we got a buddy who's at the Department of Energy, and uh, I've been talking to him throughout this whole debacle that we're dealing with, the whole supply and demand, demand issue simultaneously. Um, he called me the other day. I was in the middle of something. I was just spitballing different ideas, kind of throwing ideas at the wall to see what would stick. Uh, I pitched him on an idea. I said, what, what about if we uh, retrofit our refineries to, to process more domestic crude? Well, turns out he texted me this morning. He goes, so uh, I took your idea, ran with it. Um, it actually made it to the meeting with uh, the president and all of the uh, executives uh, of like Exxon, Chevron. Who else is on that? I know um, Hillcorp was there. Hillbrand. Uh, Oxy, a few others. Uh, and uh, Darren Woods from Exxon shot it down and said it was a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I got the check in the box. Check yeah. in the box. Trump contributed to the national meeting. Yeah, yeah. we can we can keep throwing out stupid ideas all fucking day. You just let us know what you need, Trump. Yeah. I got plenty but, more where that came from. <laughs> my marketing director, I, I hit him up and I said I was coming on this live stream, and he so he, he did a little research. He wasn't a lot of super familiar with you guys, and he's like, "What's Bropec?" And I I hadn't heard of it at the time, <laughs> and I I just like lost it. Like, oh man, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Like it's a no fucking brainer. Of course, of course they're doing this. <laughs> you didn't even need an explanation. Explanation you already knew. Um, Josh Josh Pollard said in the uh, comments he made a comment about microbrewery startups getting murdered. That's one of my favorite uh, private startup bubbles to hammer on is microbreweries, especially up there in the Denver area. It's like how many fucking breweries do we need to fund? I think that we have plenty of alcohol going around. Yeah, blue bottle coffee. Just like, yeah, we're gonna get venture backed, uh, like retail stores. There's no way to engineer this for more profit, but we're gonna venture back it anyway. It makes sense to me. <laughs> we have a couple of uh, send Dave Portnor some Bropec merch for his unboxings. <laughs> dude, that's fucking genius. We should. He's gonna get in and be like, "What the fuck is this shit?" Yeah. What is Bropec? <laughs> what is OPEC? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> We should definitely, we got to figure out how to send them some gear. We should do that. Um, the address is public on the internet. It shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> Who the fuck does that? Dude, if I send someone my address, like I'm sure you can find my address pretty easy on the internet, but I definitely have some hitmen coming after me. Um, especially. Hey, Petro is going to put a hit out on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll have to talk about that one some other time, but um, we got a post coming out on Sanchez energy that I think is going to piss off few people here so i think that'll come out tomorrow um anyways along those lines al 96 said i think the biggest impact 
would be for the EMP uh, companies to shift away from being Ponzi schemes and <laughs> providing return on investment. That's fair cool. point. Fair point. Yeah. Can't argue that. And then right under it's that, a bold Randy, strategy. <laughs> Randy, Randy said, given the current climate, is there still room for higher capex, higher value projects? Think fiber optics, or do they go away for more inexpensive legacy options? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, there, no way to justify that at the board meeting. If it, if it doesn't work, you're fired. Yeah. All, all nice to haves, all discretionary income for everybody is completely gone. If it's not essential, it doesn't happen. And so even things as cool as fiber objects, not going to happen in this climate. Yeah. But say, but I, say like I had someone hit me up the other day and they're using fiber optics, uh, downhole to monitor frack hits. Say that you had a technology like this that has proven itself to um, reduce frack hits and save your assets. Do you take a look at that? Should you be fracking right now? <laughs> Listen, the motherfuckers are fracking right now. It's not a question if you should be or shouldn't be. They're doing it. So if you are fracking, then yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt. But if you're not fracking, you're probably smart. And then you're probably not going to be taking a look at it. I, I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is you got places like uh, – the Hibernia facility off the east coast of Newfoundland, one of the biggest offshore developments in the world. You know, they, they have the straw in the ground. It's it's not a unconventional resource. It's a big pocket of oil. They're looking at shutting down for 12 to 18 months. They don't have to have to do anything except turn on the tap or turn off the tap. And they're turning off the tap because that's the reality. And I think in in that sort of economic situation, uh, you realize how how squeezed those guys are. Um, cause there's, yeah. there's no expense. There's, there's no, it's, there's no fracking. There's no risk. It's just go for it. And they're saying, no, thank you. So that's, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. That's, it's a huge facility. So, um, yeah. Anyway, solid, not, point. Uh, solid point. Um, I was looking at this comment from Albert Zubia that says several people have posted publicly that right now is not a time to sell, but a time to help others. We're in survival mode. What do you guys think? Um, I don't know what you're referencing when saying selling what, but I mean, I can just tell you from a macro perspective that like you can have all the kumbaya bullshit that you want, but the industry's fucking in trouble right now. And I mean, 75% of the industry is insolvent. I mean, that's my estimation, but I mean, like people don't have anything to give to help each other. You know, whether you're talking about from the EMPs, OFS, startups, uh, capital groups, like it's not a matter of wanting to help. I mean, th business is cutthroat anyways, right? So everyone's trying to get something before they go bankrupt. Well, I mean, I mean, to Albert's point, I, I, I think he might have been referring to when we were talking about how do you sell in, in today's climate, like, you know, for us oh, as startups or oh, things like that. Okay. So I went and on I a rant for nothing. No, I mean, <laughs> you can hold that position if you want. But I think for me, I, and I, I do understand his point that like, it, it's not the time to be necessarily grabbing at things, but at the same time, you know, it's a matter of perspective. I mean, for, for those of us, all of us here being small business people, us being able to sell and being able to keep these businesses going, it just keeps more people employed. And, and that's, that's what keeps me motivated. That's what made me sit down and say, you know, do I look at taking a pay cut or do, you know, how do we adjust our burn rate so that I can make sure that, you know, without a doubt, I'm going to be able to keep my team on staff for as long as possible. So it's uh, like, to me, that, that is helping others and selling is a part of that. We just closed a deal. I feel, I feel all right. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. I think this comment also speaks because, because obviously, well, we were three of us here were in the, in Houston during Harvey, right. Which is, Kind of our closest touch point to a disaster of this magnitude that we've had in the last couple mm -hmm. of years and it just feels so different right i mean in harvey it was raining uh i went down to the uh, to the convention center and helped put up beds and saw the people coming in from the streets you know completely soaking wet their houses had been flooded and we were handing out food we were trying to help i mean that's i think when when people think of trying to help that's what they mean right it's so bizarre now that the weather, I mean, the weather has been absolutely perfect these last two weeks or three weeks in Houston. You can step outside and have a great day. And yet um, there's all this economic pain being felt because the restaurants are closed. 
people are slashing jobs, the oil patch is hurting tremendously, right? And obviously people are also getting sick and they're and are gonna get sicker. So it's this weird, like like to your point, you know, how how do you really help in this environment? It's not it's not handing out, it's not going and volunteering at the hospital, right? Like it was at Harvey volunteering, keeping people dry or or helping yeah. them go to shelter. So there is something to be said about trying to keep a business going. And you know, nobody's arm twisting anybody to, you know, buy anything here. But by offering services that may actually help the businesses you're selling to survive as well, because you're providing value. And, and that was kind of my point earlier is that sometimes when when there when these things happen, if you if you can get people to listen to you, they finally do actually listen to what you're offering. Whereas there are other times when, you know, oil's at 120 or whatever, ah, just spend it on whatever we've been spending it for the last 10 years. Who cares? Right. Um, that's where that's that's where I think my mind is in this, right? It's like we're not we're not aggressively trying to go, you know, hey, you gotta listen to us, you gotta, you gotta pay attention. We understand that the companies are in a lot of pain, but at the same time, we are trying to make a case of of helping. Like, hey, we have a product, maybe it'll help you, maybe it won't, but we wanna have that conversation and um, there's nothing else we can do, right? Because we're just all stuck at home trying to make the economy, you know, trying to trying to keep the economy from completely imploding. Yeah, it's interesting how you brought up Hurricane Harvey because um, I made a I made a post like on Facebook or something last week, and I was just making fun of people that are stocking up on ammo. I was like, "What are y'all gonna do? Fucking shoot the virus out of the air?" And yeah. anyways, my point was though it was like during Hurricane Harvey, it was completely different, right? Like everyone was helping each other. Like I mean. Hurricane Harvey was probably the most apocalyptic shit. If you lived in Houston, the most apocalyptic shit that you'll ever experience in your life. And, you know, same Ted, I was out on a boat the entire week, you know, getting people out of their homes and to a, a dry place and everyone is helping each other. But this time feels different because how do you help? Well, I can't help you with money because I don't have a job myself. You know, I can't give you a, a dry place to stay because we're not fighting, you know, some, so you even see this, you know, just outside of business, you see it um, in society as well. So it was interesting that you brought that up. Um, we have a couple of good comments here that I want to get to. Oh. One was Austin Newsom's. Yeah, right here. Are there any oil field service companies or segments that due to long-term contracts or some other advantage are relatively insula insulated from the ongoing pain? I saw one today. So Double Eagle Energy, I don't know if you guys remember this, uh, headed up by uh two two guys uh both 35 uh collectively worth like 500 million bucks now they sold some acreage to either parsley or pioneer it was one of the sheffields uh for like 2.8 billion dollars a few years ago made a bunch of headlines um it's i saw that they are moving from being heavily on the sell side to now they're looking to go and buy a whole bunch um with with some backing from apollo but the what i want to highlight in that article was that this is that they were heavily and they emphasized heavily, heavily hedged uh, through the end of 2021. And so companies that uh, were able to, to hedge a lot of the production very early on are very insulated um, from, from the effects of uh, the current com commodity prices. Did you guys see the thing with uh, uh, Wimbledon? No. I saw that, yeah. Did, I, I okay. that so, on, uh, so get this. Wimbledon, the tennis tournament, that's what you call it. I don't know. I don't follow tennis, but for the last 20 years has been paying for pandemic insurance. So for the last 20 years, they've paid something like 40 million in premiums. Don't quote me on that number, but something ridiculous. 28 million a year, I think. Yes. No, it wasn't that much, not per year, but over the course, it was something like that. But they got $141 million payout for having to cancel due to COVID. And it just makes me laugh like a fucking tennis tournament has more insulation and foresight than some energy companies do. Like think about like if I was an oil company, I'd definitely want some type of insurance. I'd happily pay a premium. It's like, Hey, if there's some pandemic that just absolutely kills demand, be nice to get some money for it. Mm. And, and I think that, I mean, that, that was probably, I I'm sure that some of the folks in the Wimbledon management are financiers. If I was a betting man, uh, <laughs> probably and, so. The I, I think that this you know this this was viewed by many as sort of like a, a mathematical eventuality. So if you're gonna look at all the governments of the world ignoring this, and you know that because they all come and sit at the boxes at your tennis tournament, that's that seems like a good bet to me. <laughs> you got a good point. I mean, yeah. 
I've never, I'm not the type to sit amongst a uh, Wimbledon crowd. So um, <laughs> I'm sure yeah. it's a lot of white collar guys though. Uh, to answer that question, Robert Smith, who we had on last time, uh, shout out to Robert, uh, said that OFS and Midstream are having all their contracts re renegotiated right now, which is yeah, the that, exact same thing. That's another point I was going to bring up too, is like contracts don't mean shit. No. They don't. You know, you have all these Midstream MOP type structures, you know, with takeaway and shit and like everyone's renegotiating. Like when times get tough, everyone goes back to the negotiation table, right? So your contract can, can't insulate you from everything. And that's not oil field specific. No, that's uh, everything. Yeah. Oh, oh, we work just had a $3 billion. No, thanks. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> yes. SoftBank pulled the rug out from under them and now SoftBank's getting sued, which I don't think that's going to work out too well for we work, but I guess they have to try. Okay. So Britain had a good uh, well, question. Guys now. Said, why would retrofitting the refineries be a bad idea? Is it not good for long-term or diversifying our domestic needs? To be honest, we're, um, we're kind of waiting to hear back from a few people to see, is this a good idea or a bad idea? I'm yeah, just, I, don't think I think, it's, it's I think that we're going to create an entire piece of con uh, content around this because one, I don't know enough about downstream to comment one way or another. Um, but I've had several people say that one, the, that the money, the capital needed would be an issue. But if you bring up the trillions that are being pumped into the economy through stimulus, say that money wasn't an issue doesn't make sense. You know, if Trump was to say, Hey, you know, we'll dedicate a trillion dollars to infrastructure, oil and gas to retrofit refineries doesn't make sense. Okay. So get past that point. Doesn't make sense from an operational standpoint. I've had a couple of comments over on Twitter that's, that says it doesn't, but, um, I, I don't know why. I, I, I know that maybe, maybe to add a little bit to this, I know, uh, Keystone XL bringing crude from Alberta down into the U S uh, was, was just greenlit after so many years of, of getting stymied. So that would be even more in my eyes, justification to expand refining capacity. Cause you got basically the, the, the whole output of Alberta coming down. Yeah. And I think Jake's point and some others point of retrofitting refineries is to be able to uh, refine more of our domestic crude, our light grade uh, crude, instead of exporting it and importing in heavier crude from overseas, you know, kind of um, cut off our downstream from uh, any international players and give us a little bit more quote unquote energy independence. But we'll have to get someone on the show that knows that shit a little bit better than us and we can get some some answers to that. Um, Jordan Tim said, Colin found dead at home, whacked by 65 year old completions consultant. So uh, the, the comments have been wild. I've been <laughs> having a great time. <laughs> if you're watching and you don't know, you don't get this joke for some reason over the past couple of years on my LinkedIn. Um, Every once in a while, someone comes on my LinkedIn talking shit, and it's a very high correlation that if you come on my LinkedIn talking shit, you're a 65-year-old completions consultant. For some, for some reason, that demographic just does not <laughs> like me. So I got serious, serious beef with them that I have to figure out. <laughs> but, uh, do they also – do they age with you or do they just stay static? At no, it's like, dude, it's like, uh, yeah. it's like that, uh, a dazed and confused quote. It's like, they just keep staying the same <laughs> age. Like someday I'll be 65 years old and it's still going to be the 65 year old. <laughs> it's not a fucking problem with me. So, um, we got a lot of other, other comments over here. Let's see. Um, it's, it's mostly people just building on these hilarious comments. It's been super entertaining <laughs> to read. Like you get about 45 minutes into a show and people start talking shit. So it, it takes know, a while uh, for them to get warm. It started up. much earlier. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Gabriel uh, Padigo's comment um, about natural gas being up. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I, yeah, bring up, bring up uh, Gabriel's. Because it, that's actually an interesting, uh, so he, and he had a follow up to that, right? That he thinks it's because they've adopted to garbage prices. Actually, uh, I was talking to my brother about this. He's also a petroleum geologist. And I think one of the reasons you see, and I, I don't know much about it, but one of the reasons you see natural gas prices go up is because there's so much natural gas produced associated with oil. So as we actually halt the oil production, we halt a big, big chunk of the natural gas production yeah. in the country. And that's why you see the prices go up. I mean, it's a fair point technically, but did you guys see my uh, D-Day, Oilfield D-Day video? Did y'all happen to see that? 
I <laughs> yes. think so. That was, that okay. was amazing. Yeah. Actually, yes. The, the was, Saving you, Private Ryan one? Yes. I, yeah. I saw it a couple different times. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the we day. all the different jokes. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, you know, guys are, are at the end of the video. There's guys running off the boat. They're on fire. And I made those the Nat Gas Bulls because I know there are Nat Gas Bulls out there and they're just getting absolutely fucking torched. And, you know, you you take Gabriel's or, uh, Gabriel's comment and say, uh, you know, the only optimistic people in my experience are the Nat Gas players. Look, I've never met an oil man or a gas man that doesn't think that commodity prices are going up. They always think that they're going up. And I think you look at, you know, I'm not a trader. I'm not really like a commodity market guy, but I follow up a little bit. And you look at what happened in demand in the winter this year. It was fucking terrible. These guys got crushed. I think that the forward curve looks fucking terrible for these guys. Like, I don't know how anyone can be bullish on Nat Gas. I mean, it's sad that we're getting bullish. Like, oh shit, maybe we can get $3 Nat Gas. Like, I mean, we it's you know it's even an oil like anyone that's bullish on oil that oh saudi you know um saying or opec saying that we're gonna have a 10 million barrel uh production cut like cool where does that get us to 50 dollars? like all these shell companies are still fucking dead at 50 dollars. and i mean we, we're not setting a very you know high high bar for ourselves here so yeah they may be optimistic but i mean i i don't see anything to be optimistic about well, that was that was a real like uh, rousing uh, comment there, Colin. I feel so excited. <laughs> Look, man, I don't control this shit. <laughs> and like you go uh, back, like Ted, you go to your point, like okay, like we've seen how much gas we're flaring out in the in the Permian Basin, right? So if we stop producing oil, and I mean, there obviously going to be a huge decrease in that gas, but I mean, for the time being, the the demand has. You know, I look at everything that's happening today, like oil fucking rallying on on any of this news is just ridiculous because we're backed up all the way from the gas pump to the wellhead. EMPs have to shut in. So demand's just getting crushed. And, you know, I heard from a, a top uh, hedge fund guy that they expect WTI to go to single digits. So, you know, I... The, the demand issue is real and I don't think yeah. that we're going to get over that anytime soon. So yeah. I, di I didn't realize you were such a Buddhist. Like life is pain and all that stuff. In what sense? Oh, life is pain. <laughs> so it's like, dude, so, you call me fat because I have put on 10 pounds in the last yeah, month. I was like, dude, yeah. this guy's talking shit to me. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so Colin, I'd be interested to hear, and I think you're right. Right. I mean, my, my point was just saying there's a, they balance out, right, because you, you reduce the amount of gas you're producing with the oil, but it doesn't mean that demand will be there, right? That's, I think, what you're yeah. saying, is that the price will still fall because demand is falling. Um, I guess, yeah. what, 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 do you, what do you think we need to jumpstart the economy again? I mean, what, what, what does, you know, what, what do we need to do to get that demand back up? Yeah, I mean, obviously opening up our economy is going to be the catalyst that gets demand uh, driven back up. But, you know, I think one thing that's really important to understand that a lot of people, I mean, I know some high level guys that don't have a con conceptual understanding of markets and how they work. But a lot of people think that American oil and gas has to be around, that these shell companies have to operate. Oh, well, oil and gas prices have to come up because these producers aren't making any money. Well, it's not how markets work. Markets don't give a fuck if any shell companies stay around. The energy is going to be supplied by the lowest marginal cost supplier, right? And that's Saudi, Venezuela, Russia. Um, so I think that it, you're, you're really fooling yourself if you think that shell players have to stick around. They don't have to. They have to be able to operate and compete with the lowest marginal cost suppliers um, and be able to operate within those parameters so you know from a demand perspective i think obviously once we open up the economy over you know the next six months hopefully demand gets back to where it was prior um but that demand i don't you know opec's been playing nice with us for the past few years and i don't think that um, demand is going to be fulfilled by american shell players yeah. to to a somewhat more opportunistic bent um, do you, have you guys thought at all about how this is going to impact more, less the price wars and more the, the current sort of pandemic situation, how that's going to affect the actual sort of
sort of day-to-day -day operation of West Texas in whatever capacity it, it continues to operate, things like that. I mean, the from, yeah. from, from what everybody's been saying, this is going to be the reality of our lives for the next 18 to 24 months. So maybe we talk about opportunities, we talk about selling. Maybe it's, yeah, we're, we're, we're a med tech startup now and we're going to sell hard hats with built-in masks or whatever but but legitimately I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's you know that's where the money's to be made right now well i mean look at it from your perspective joe i mean you see pictures of these rigs requiring you know they're turning away third-party sales right um i think walter white gave just the same speech <laughs> um you look at these rigs you know, you go out to rig, you typically have to sign in, check in if yep. it's a big operator. Well, now they're just fucking turning around everyone. And, you know, I've heard they're taking people's temperatures to go out there. So I can see ops lock, you know, having an opportunity like, hey, we can help you with this process. So oh. but I know I sound like a pessimist on this call, but I'm a realist. And I also believe that the best companies are built during times like this. I think that this opens up a lot of opportunities. So, um, you know, don't get my messaging uh, or, you know, mixed up. I think that there's a lot of opportunity out there. And I think that, uh, yeah. you know, the day-to-day -day operations are changing. I think that society as a whole is going to be ch changed after this. Yep. I mean, is, you know, I'm going to top investment banks and no one's shaking hands at financial institutions. I mean, you know, I'm going, cool. some lady, some lady an hour ago wouldn't get in the elevator with me because I didn't have a mask on. I mean, Maybe. it's going to change the way people operate. To, to that to that point, I, I think we're you know I'm I'm the one guy here not in Houston and uh, where where I am in well I'm in Quebec right now and we've got a little we have more COVID cases than all of Texas and about thirty percent of the population um, so we're a little bit further on this journey than you guys and mm -hmm. wow. you know I I see guys talking about oh we gotta let businesses open and things like that and I understand that sentiment I'm just saying like talking to you from a week from now. People stop saying that uh, when when you start to see these huge spikes, and I I have it on good authority from guys on the boards of public companies who are our investors that you know we're, we're really looking at a um, you know th this is going to be a, a reality for the next sort of at least the rest of this year that sort of social distancing in some capacity is going to continue to be a thing. So I think for the folks that listen or or here who I assume are in some way interested in you know how are we going to get our you know, uh, our business is going or, or what have you in, in this current sort of world, the, that's what I'd be looking at is how do you build the tools that help these companies in whatever capacity operate safely. Now that, you know, if you go to Asia, if you go to Thailand for the last 10 years, the guy who's like cooking your food in the street is wearing a mask because they deal with this shit all the time. And that's how it's changed their life. Yeah. And I think we're not that far from when you go to get your haircut, like your barber's going to be wearing a mask because that's what it is. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, we're, on that point, like I go to, I go on a walk with my family last night to the <laughs> pond and me and my wife are sitting next to each other at the pond on the grass. And my eight year olds like, Hey, social distancing, social distancing. I mean, this younger generation's having that pounded in their head already. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we didn't grow up with, like, you ever heard the term social distancing when you were a kid? Fuck no. I mean, I didn't hear it until I was 30 years old, two months ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it's already changing generations. Uh, a comment that I wanted to highlight here, um, this is a talking point. Uh, <laughs> there's actually another comment from Al. It Al's wasn't got a, great comment. Al, dude, we got to get Al on the show because he's got some great commentary here. But uh, a little bit ago, he said, what refiner in their right mind would invest that amount of money in processing oil supply that won't exist in a few years? And that's another talking point that I didn't bring up is that if you believe that, you know, 75% of shale operators are insolvent and aren't going to be around, why would you spend that time and money um, and future um, opportunity cost if there's there's no product to refine. So that's definitely a uh, thing to consider as well. Yeah, but again, you have to remember, right, that the U.S. is the only country in the world where the oil, right, the mineral rights are privately owned. Yeah. So no nowhere else in the world is is the mineral rights privately owned, and that in, that includes Canada, right? And uh, actually, I uh, learned someone someone said that parts of canada are i learned that like two weeks ago they corrected me really yeah i'll okay. google it i don't I didn't, know yeah google I google it because i didn't know that actually it would, it would have been the good. queen gets a royalty from the the mineral rights in canada but yeah like, i've always i've always, always said man. that america's the only one but apparently someone up in canada's fucking up uh so fucking up that pitch 
So, you know, when, when I mean, the oil will always be there, right? It's going to continue being underground and you're going to have to, you're going to keep having people trying to extract it as long as we continue to produce it or, I mean, need it in society and burn it and, and turn it into plastics and everything else. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe shale oil won't be there. Maybe these you know, giant companies fracking wells won't be there, but we're actually seeing the second wave of companies with this technology, which now the innovation, right? The new unconventional, right? The unconventional, unconventional, like the new, new thing is uh, taking these new technologies to um, existing, you know, high permeability plays. Really, we should call it low permeability and high permeability plays. Mm -hmm. So we're that's going back point. to high yeah. permeability. Yeah, high permeability plays. And um, that's where the oil, right, we can now extract more because that, that's one of the things that fascinates me about, about oil and gas technology and, and kind of my comment about, about uh, being a science startup, right, is that we actually understand so little about what, act, what goes on in the subsurface. You know, we might think we got 30% of the oil, but the logs and the petrophysics we relied to do that calculation are actually all wrong. Okay, so uh, I'll speak a little bit to that. Like, I, I remember hearing that there's some curve, I think it's the neutron porosity curve. They figured out that it's actually miscalculated in the 90s, they, they, it wasn't calibrated correctly, but they just kept that calibration because everybody had standardized around the wrong calibration, right? And so, because it's, it's more of a pattern recognition game than an actual measurements game. And so, um, and you could say that about the industry in general. Right. And so we really don't know how much oil is there. And, and yes, it's going to change, but we will continue to extract oil out of the ground in, in the U.S. because it's privately owned and people will always want to, you know, make make money off of that. There won't be a central government authority that says you can't extract this oil unless you know, they won't because it's private property. So um, that's what I think yeah. when, when people bring up this fact, like this comment that says it won't be around. Maybe it won't be around in this shape or form, but we will be producing oil. And we I, I don't see that we'll be producing any less oil if you look at 20 years from now or you know, 10 years from now. Maybe there'll be dips and, and curves. That's fair. Better. Yeah. It's funny, be oil. it's funny you mentioned that about the calibration because Colin and I have talked about, is there a systemic issue with the way that type curves have historically been generated based on looking at, looking at the way that uh, most operators have forecasted production and then consistently miss those product uh, projections? Are they overly optimistic or is there an, an underlying issue systemically with the type curves? And I, well, one problem is, is they cherry pick their best wells to model off of. So you have that problem. Um, yeah. I mean, well, that, that actually is one of the reasons that these operators, you know, have had trouble, right? Is that, that, that your type curve that everybody based their economics around, right? Either they misunderstood, you know, the, the difference between exponential and, and uh, uh, linear or, uh, you see, I'm, I myself am getting myself confused. I know that there's two phases of production, right? Mm -hmm. Where the rate of change is constant and then the rate of change actually changes. So that's the exponential. Um, and this was misunderstood. The physics around this is complicated, right? Like we, we really didn't have a lot of good examples when companies started to do their base economics. Um, and so they definitely overestimated it. And it, especially if all you did was ARPS equation, right? I mean, ARPS is, you know, 1930s. I think that paper came out at 40s and it just doesn't apply to low. Was that that long ago? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was really a long time ago. And so um, it, it, it is a, it's a non-unique answer business, if that makes any sense. And so, you know, when you're buying stocks, it's a unique answer. You know who bought it at what price, when, where it went, where they bought it, you know, and let, that's why it can be traded at microseconds. And you have those high fiber optic cables and trying to get the straightest line to shave off the, the mm -hmm. time, etc. When you're dealing with this industry, it's a non-unique solution. Now, what is a non-unique solution? It's a thesis-based industry, right? It's I believe this and Colin believes it also, and you believe something different. And we're all right because you can't prove us wrong. You can only state your opinion based on your facts. I mean, that's what science is built on. And so um, that's not really recognized by people that aren't scientists. And I think that has caused some pain for investors particularly.
Ted, I think this is a good question for you from uh, Robert Smith again. What are we going to do about the lack of expertise across the geoscience space, which is at least a, a lost start in the shale and highly critical for conventional plays? Yeah, no, excellent question, Robert. So, I mean, I can tell you, I do a little little sales plug in here, right? I mean, at subsurface IO, one of the reasons we're, one of the ways we're tackling this is just making geoscience data more accessible. So we're a SaaS platform that's available online and you can just access all the geologic data. You don't have to be a data wrangler and a geotech and an extra and an expert petrophysicist to look at these logs and start to understand the subsurface. Um, so then it then it just becomes a question of you know the actual experience in analyzing logs. And I think that there's a lot of ways that that's going to be handled in the future. One is obviously going to be machine learning and AI enabled you know helpers kind of like image recognition technology. We'll have, you know, petrophysical recognition technology that will help us. And we're also gonna get a better handle on the underlying data and what it means. So I, I actually think it's gonna become much easier to be a geologist in, in the coming years because it will be more of a pattern recognition and experience rather than a, you know, understanding these complex softwares, understanding where the data comes from, understanding what the data means. You know, I, I brought up this thing about the neutron porosity. I mean, that's well known, but it's not well captured. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to solve and make it more easy, you know, easier for people to understand and then just get down to the nuts and bolts of the interpretation because it will come down to an interpretation. You're gonna have to trust that petrophysicist to tell you that there's, you know, 30% porosity versus 32% porosity and they'll have a material impact on your economics. Um, so, that that I, I actually see as a positive. Yeah, I think we're going to run into something interesting here because you know obviously everyone's aware of the great crew change that we've dealt with, um, you know, in the past few years. Um, you know, obviously uh, a, a gap in between the boomers and millennials, uh, Gen X, was just kind of you know disappeared, left the industry, and never came back. And we face that same thing here coming up in the next ten to twenty years. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of people that are going to leave and not come back. But then you're going to have this just really young generation that, um, you know, that they didn't do unconventionals and the people that are teaching them didn't do unconventional. So it's almost like we don't get this knowledge grab of the older generation before they leave. You may have some interesting projects going on in the future in conventional yeah. and unconventional space. So it'd be you interesting. Know, you know, I, I had a, I had a really good mentor at Exxon mobile when I, when I worked for Exxon and, he, when this all started, you know, 2000, this was back in 2009, he, he said he had, he had been part of the crew change in the 80s that had occurred before. And he told me that, you know, his generation made so many mistakes and we were just bound to repeat the same mistakes again because of the cyclical nature of this. I mean, the, the knowledge just leaves the industry. And, you know, here we are again. I mean, this was also, <laughs> I remember walking around ExxonMobil and people saying, just be prepared for oil hitting, you know, single digits. Or, yeah. <laughs> no way, that can't happen, right? And having lived through two downturns now, I can look back and say that. So um, we're definitely going to lose a lot of knowledge. I think we, we need a better way. And there are startups out there that are trying to capture some of the, you know, institutional knowledge. Yeah that is present from all of the, the people that have been in the industry for so many years. Um, and that should be encouraged. But also, you know, you come in with the, the, the tools are rusty, right? And so you can't just hand a rusty set of pliers to the next generation and go, well, this is the way we did it. So, you know, keep cutting, <laughs> or keep yeah. doing whatever, right? I mean, you know, we have a blowtorch now or, or, or whatever we have, a, 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 a new, set of pliers. <laughs> a new set of pliers. I, I was trying to think of something more fancier than a plier. <laughs> I guess a plier is pretty basic. So <laughs> let's say a rusty saw, and now we have a circular saw kind of thing, right? And so it takes a new skill set, but the, the basics of cutting a straight line have to be passed on to the next generation, and that's where you know, we need to focus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, real quick, before we end this call, we had a comment from Rob Smith that says the love – Love the work y'all did with New Tech. Um, I'm assuming he's talking about you, Ted. So yeah. um, kudos to you for doing good work with New Tech. Um, guys, appreciate y'all coming on the show. It's been a fun hour. Got to have you on again. Uh, this is no really good. Conversation. Guys. 
<laughs> it goes by so quick. Yeah. Dude, I know. And I'm always like, I'm always like concerned. I'm like, fuck, we don't have enough shit to talk about for an hour. And uh, with the hope of some good fucking comments, some good chatter um, from Josh and Al and Rob and all the guys that are in there, it makes it fly by. Yeah. So really quickly. So uh, if you guys haven't listened to the episodes with Joe has been on twice, so you can go to wildcatters.com, digitalwildcatters.com, uh, check out both of his episodes and then, oh, Colin, you have to use your finger. There we go. And Ted's episode is going to drop uh, either <laughs> next week. Um, and so everybody go check that out whenever it drops. You'll actually get to dive deeper into uh, all of his work with Subsurface IO, uh, his background, and, and how they've pivoted a few times. And so uh, super excited to release that to the world. So thanks to, to both of you guys for joining us. We always love having conversations with you guys. And uh, just so everybody knows, I texted uh, Kyle Chapman. We're going to get him and his co-founder, Jacob Avery, back on the show uh, whenever they're not having technical difficulties. So uh, thanks for everybody for joining us. And we will catch you guys same time, same place next week. Later, guys. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. See you later.